I'm going to do a quick presentation on Moray, <coughs> Moray 1959, Attention in Dichotic Listening, Effective Cues, and the Influence of Instructions. Uh, let's start off with the background. Colin Cherry had noted that however deep in conversation you might be at a cocktail party, if someone mentioned your name in another conversation, this would draw your attention. So for example, if you're at a party and you're just chilling with your friends and someone else in the background mentions your name, you, you'll be drawn to that situation because you've heard your name. It's probably happened a few times. Um, but yeah, dichotic listening tasks uh, present two different auditory stimuli into different ears through headphones. Um, so basically, you might have like one story in one headphone and another story in the other. And I'll talk to you more about that in a sec. Uh, but Cherry devised a method called shadowing to study attention in listening. When shadowing a task, participants listen dichotically to two stimuli and are instructed to repeat one out loud. Thus, they are focusing on the attended task while blocking out the other rejected task. So one task is being like repeated, like so if you're hearing something through one ear, you, you'd be asked to repeat that task, while in the other ear, you're being asked to like block that information and just focus on this attended task. Uh, this is an example of a dichotic listening task. And as you can see, there's like the ignored one, so the rejected message, and then there's the, the attended message. And this is just a quick example. Uh, so the aims that Cherry had, uh, sorry, Murray had, uh, was to provide a rigorous empirical test of Cherry's findings. And Cherry had found that the participants who shadowed a task could recall nothing of the content of the reje rejected task. However, they could distinguish between noise, speech and tones, could recognise clicks and obvious changes in pitch. So while this message was like no one could remember any content, there were aspects that people could remember. So Murray like, wanted to provide rigorous evidence. Uh, so the sample, um, Murray actually didn't provide a sample for the first experiment, but he did say that it consisted of undergraduate students and research workers of both sexes. Uh, Murray does not provide a sample, as I just said, uh, but in the second experiment, he tells us that 12 participants participated in experiment 2 and two groups of 14 participants were used in experiment 3. So here comes the procedure for all experiment for all the experiments. So three laboratory experiments were conducted. All were dichotic listening tasks that required the participants to show one message while two messages were played to them, uh, one in each ear. When paying attention to just one message, we set up a block on any other message and focus our attention on the selected message at hand. Murray was interested in what types of message would penetrate this block and be paid attention to by participants. So these were like the common apparatus used for all of the experiments. And uh, this is quite a detailed description. So Brunel Mark, he used a Brunel Mark IV stereophonic tape recorder modified with twin amplifiers to give two independent outputs through attenuators, one output going to each of the earpieces in a set of headphones. Loudness was matched to each earpiece by asking the participants to say when the messages appeared to be of equivalent volume to them. And this was within uh, one, one decibel on either side. The passages were all recorded by one male speaker. All participants completed four trial shadowing tasks on passages of prose for practice prior to the study. The volume of each message was about 60 decibels above the participants' hearing threshold. The speech rate of the messages was approximately 150 words a minute. Uh, this is an example of like a Brunel, this is probably like a Mark V stereophonic tape recorder, but here's a quick example of what it looks like. So it's quite an old piece of equipment, and remember this study was in 1959, so you can expect it to look a bit old. We could probably do this study t today just on our phones. So this is experiment one, and a short list of words was spoken 35 times as the rejected message. At the end of the shadowing task, the participants were asked to recall all they could, could remember of the rejected message. Approximately 30 seconds after the shadowing task, 
the participants were given a recognition test consisting of 21 words. <clears throat> seven of the words from the recognition test were from the shadowed passage. Seven were from the list of words in the rejected message. And the last seven were similar words but were not present in either passage. And this acted as a control condition. Here are the results from experiment one. Uh, so as you can see, there were th this was for the seven words from the shadowed passage and 4.9 uh, on, on average were recognized out of the seven. So that was pretty good. However, when it comes to the rejected uh, passage, and people only recognized 1.9 of the words, which conveys that uh, the rejected message wasn't like they weren't perceiving it when they were uh, shadowing the uh, attended message. And this was actually lower than the control group, uh, the control condition, where seven similar words that appeared in either passage were used, which was 2.6. Uh, so here's an um, experiment one discussion. Although the sh uh, short list of words in the rejected message was spoken 35 times, the participants were unable to recall them. Moray concludes, in a situation where a subject directs his attention to the reception of a message from one ear and rejects the message from the other ear, almost none of the verbal content of the rejected message is able to penetrate the block set up. Uh, so this is now experiment two. Um, Moray states that there is anecdotal evidence that the block set up while shadowing one message can be broken down if the material in the rejected message is important to the person shadowing the pa passage. And this was sh shown by Colin Cherry um, in his cocktail party effect that I mentioned earlier, where if someone mentions your name, you're going to hear it even though you might be focusing on something else. In this experiment, Murray aimed to investigate whether an effective cue would penetrate the block and be attended to. The effective cue was the participant's name, given alongside instructions. Uh, so an effective cue is something that just means something to someone. So obviously their name is going to mean something to them. Uh, these effective instructions were compared with non-effective instructions, which didn't begin with the participant's name, e.g. change to your other ear instead of uh, John Smith, please change to your other ear. Two passages of light fiction were played simultaneously to, to the participants. Uh, this was dichotically, that's the formal word. Uh, both passages that the participant heard contained an instruction within it. In all cases, the passages began with an instruction to listen to their right ear. In two cases, uh, this was in passage 8 and passage 10, this initial instruction was immediately followed by a warning that the participant would receive instructions to change ears. The instructions that were contained within the passage passages took three forms. Uh, form one, three consisted of an effective instruct, three consisted of, of effective instructions. The participants' names. These were passages three, seven, and ten. Three passages consisted of non-effective instructions, uh, and this is where like no mention of the participants' names. Uh, and this was where. where this happened in passages 1, 5, and 8. In four instances, there were no instructions within the passage. And this occurred in passages 1, uh, sorry, 2, 4, 6, and 9. Participants had 10 trials, and each time listening to two passages of light fiction, they did a shadowing task each time. Murray was interested in seeing whether the participants were more likely to hear the instruction with the rejected message if it was preceded by their name, uh, which is also known as an effective cue. The passages were read in a steady monotone voice at a pace of 130 words per minute by a single male speaker. The participants were deceived in the aim of this experiment and were told that the aim was for them to make, make as few errors in their shadowing of the passage as possible. Uh, obviously, you can link this to a bit of ethics, you know, they were deceived, but I think the deception was obviously necessary for the purpose of this study. 
Um, 12 participants took part in experiment two and were a mixture of students and research workers. As they each shadowed 10 passages of light fiction, this meant that Murray uh, anticipated having 36 affected, effective sorry, and 36 non-effective instructions to analyze. So a bit of a spelling error just there, effective. Um, but yeah, but this didn't actually happen and it's because some people actually switched when they heard the instruction, but you don't really need to study that. Okay. The performance of the participants on the shadowing task were tape recorded and analyzed. The experiment used a repeated measures design as each participant listened to all 10 passages of light fiction. And here are the results. So 39 times presented and 20 times heard when the instructions were effective. Uh, so they had their name in. And for the non-effective instructions, they were presented 36 times and only four people heard them. So that's like a five to one ratio, uh, which is quite significant. The participants were deemed to have heard a message if they reported hearing the instruction when asked about the experiment in between the fiction passages, or if when they received an instruction preceded by their name, they actually followed the instruction and switched passages. T-test analysis of the results showed that there was a less than 1% probability of the results being due to chance, which is really, really uh, highly significant. Um, this showed that the effective cues did break through the block on the rejected message and so the message was heard. Moray noted that when the participants were given a warning at the start of the passage to expect the instructions to change is there was a slight increase in the mean frequency with which the participants heard the instructions in the rejected message. Therefore, perhaps being given a pre-warning might mean a participant is more likely to hear the material in the rejected message, and Murray set up another experiment to test this theory. So this is experiment three, and the, um, the sample was two groups of 14 participants uh, that were asked to shadow one of two simultaneous dichotic messages. Again, the, the sample consisted of undergraduate students and research workers. Procedure. In some of the messages, digits, uh, spoken numbers, were put into the messages towards the end of the message. Sometimes numbers were uh, in both messages, sometimes only in the shadowed message, and sometimes only in the rejected message. Control passages with no digits were also included. The IV was the manipulation of the instructions given to set the two groups of participants. One group was told that they would be asked questions about the shadowed message at the end of each message. The other group was specifically told to remember as much as many of the digits as possible. This experiment used an independent measures design. Results. The results from this experiment showed no difference in the mean scores of digits recorded correctly between the two set conditions. Murray concluded that this was because the numbers were unlike the person's own name in experiment 2, not important enough to break through the block on the rejected message. Uh, here are the overall conclusions for all of the studies. In a situation where a subject directs his her attention to the reception of a message from one ear and rejects a message from the other ear, ear almost none of the verbal content of the rejected message can penetrate the block set up. A short list of simple words presented as the rejected message shows no trace of being remembered even when presented many times. 35 times as in experiment 1. Subjectively important messages, e.g. a person's own name, can penetrate the block. Thus, a person is more likely to hear instructions when they are preceded with their own name. It is difficult to make neutral material important enough to break through the block set up in Tychotic Shadowing, and this was shown in Experiment 3, where they put numbers in, but no one really cares about numbers, so they had uh, they, they weren't able to remember them. But yeah, so this is basically everything in, in a kind of nutshell, but a detailed nutshell. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. Um, and I'll, and I'll probably make some more videos, but just remember to make notes on these, just get it into your head, and you'll be fine in the exam. So, thank you.